Thank you, Dr. Bateman, for the Christmas gift type of introduction that you gave Anne and me. Thanks to you, Dr. Welch, for that beautiful prayer and how we have all been brought to the spirit of Christmas by the lovely music to which we have listened. It's always an honor to be at Brigham Young University. While Elder F. Enzio Busha was attempting to make a telephone call from Frankfurt, Germany on December 5th of last year, he accidentally pushed the wrong button and was connected to Elder Dean Larson at 7 a.m. Elder Ars Larson asked how things were going. Elder Busha replied by saying, it's hard to imagine how much we're learning for our experiences and from our experiences in Russia. Recently, he had visited in Moscow with the mission president there, who had several branches under his direction. He had written to each branch president, wanting to know what they were going to do to celebrate Christmas. Each branch president responded except one. Finally, the mission president uh, contacted the branch president directly about the project and was startled to hear this response. Well, President, uh, what is Christmas? He didn't know. Each of you knows what Christmas is, but today let us explore the holiday of holidays even more deeply. I have never before been in a position to deliver an early Christmas gift to as many as we have here this day. If there is a group of young adults anywhere in the world more deserving of a special Christmas gift, I cannot imagine where. A number of years ago, someone began delivering gifts to us by night, leaving them on our front porch. About two weeks before Christmas, we didn't know who it was. When the first gift was discovered, I asked our children to look around the driveway in our front porch area to see if the card had simply dropped out of the package. They couldn't find the name of the person who had brought the gift to us. The same thing happened the next day, and within another day or two, we figured someone had made our family the focus of 12 days of Christmas tradition. For almost two weeks prior to Christmas that year, a wonderful young woman dropped off gifts and, in an important way, changed the lives of our children. They were so touched with her generosity and her desire to secretly do such a nice thing that each have participated in the 12 days of Christmas for others since that time. Each holiday season brings memories of her kindness. I would like to address my remarks this day focusing on 12 present, presents that I would like to give you. I would prefer to deliver them in person, but of course that's impossible. If carefully thought about and used, they will keep you on the path of peace and joy today, tomorrow, and perhaps forever. Make this Christmas your happiest Christmas. The first present, let the gospel of Jesus Christ be your guide, your personal philosophy, and the main determinant of your decision making. Several years ago, a man I had known for 30 years asked if he could come and spend time with me in my office. I said, yes, of course, and eagerly anticipated his visit. When we sat down, he said something that surprised me. He mentioned that there were several of us that seemed to have things uh, figured out a little when we were in school so many years ago. I asked him who, and he named several of our mutual friends. In each instance, they had been people who, at around your age, had determined to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Savior made an interesting statement that only John recorded. 
We're all familiar with the words, if you love me, keep my commandments. But in that same 14th chapter of John, a few verses later, the Lord said, if ye love me, keep my words. Then he went on to reiterate the most amazing promise for someone like you he had ever made. He said, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Well, having the Savior move into your apartment or dorm would, I suppose, somewhat alter your behavior. But think for a moment, could there be a greater reward than to be that close to the Father and to the Son? Incidentally, my friend has gone on to live the gospel more deeply and thoroughly than ever before and is presently living somewhat a remarkable life because he decided to accept the gift of Jesus Christ in his life. A lovely lady wrote, You never know when someone might catch a dream from you, some little thing you say or some little thing you do, might open up the windows of a mind that seeks the light. A certain way you live might not matter, but you never really know it might. The second gift, brothers and sisters, is to select good friends. Already many of you have as friends some of the finest individuals you will ever know. They love you, they appreciate you, they are happy in your presence, and you in theirs. After your college years, you will make more friends, of course, but as the years quickly come and go, you will learn that some of your closest friends are those men and women with whom you are already acquainted. Select your friends almost as carefully, well, almost as carefully, as you select your eternal companion. Choose friends of different backgrounds and cultures. Many of your special friends are to be different from you, and from there comes great strain. Continue to earn their friendship. My wife and I, as we mail Christmas cards each year, realize that some of these wonderful school friends remain the backbone of those we love today. Friends are the bargains of life. Treat them as a special treasure. The third present, guard your name and do your best. I have a friend that I met in the seventh grade. His name is George Suval. He has been a very successful basketball coach and trainer. He's also a homespun philosopher. Periodically, I see him out walking near where we live. We stop to chat. George reported his family had come from Greece when he was very young. At first, because they didn't speak English in the home, George did not know how to read or write English very well. He was able to keep most of it a secret, but an insightful teacher, because she cared and noticed that he was always trying to do his best, spent time with him and rescued him. One day his father was attempting to explain the importance of doing the best you can to George and said, Hey, Georgia, if you're going to be anything, you be the best anything you can be. His father knew that if his son would do the best he could, then he would find success. Then his father said, Hey, Georgie, there are two things that you uh, cannot buy. It's you're a name and you're a health. Take good care of them both. Those few words provided a personal philosophy George still follows. First, do the best that you can. And that is incumbent upon all of us, brothers and sisters. Second, protect your name. It has been guarded well for so many years. And then third, guard your health. If I notice a single characteristic about the men and women I serve with, it is their commitment to go the extra mile, often tirelessly working through the hours that sometimes an individual 40 years younger will not do. The respect that you earn so often comes when you're trusted to do extra things as needed. Your good name comes from what you do and the things you say. Fourth gift, live a covenant-making life. 
Are you willing to make a contract between yourself and God, a promise? Let us talk about dating as an example. What is a date? Well, social interaction, going to a game, attending a college activity, studying together, watching a video or movie, going for a walk. Now, it is a time to covenant with God that we will behave. What if we define a date as an opportunity for each of you to get to know someone better by promising yourself that at the end of the evening, the person you have been with is a better person than when you left with them on a date? Can you say at the end of an evening, thank you for being such a kind person? It has been wonderful being with you tonight. Or maybe a date is a time to visit someone in need. Is it possible that your best dates are when you lift and teach and help and bless another? Could a date be a time to discuss the gospel of Jesus Christ in all of its magnificence? How about sharing a secret thought, an eternal dream, a future hope? Shouldn't a date be a frustration-free, guilt-free experience? Covenant with the Lord, promising him you will leave circumstances better than you find them. The fifth present, give the Savior a chance to build you to your full potential. The Lord will push you right to the brink if you allow him to do so. It was Jesus who stated, be therefore perfect even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Plead with the Lord to give you more challenges. If you study 20 hours each week, then say, Lord, I'm going for more. Let his example give you the power to ask, in addition to what I'm doing, what else can I do? Heights of great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, toiled ever upward in the night. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, when in high school, received a very low grade on an English essay he wrote. He went to Miss Mary Mason and said, This is not fair. This is good work. I deserve a better grade. She said, Sorry. I grade students by potential, and you are capable of much better work. Elder Maxwell has often stated, She made the great difference in my life. Why? Because he wanted to meet her expectations. He wanted to do as well as he could. And because of that, he has continued as one of the most verbal and clear-thinking people in the kingdom. Are we meeting the Lord's expectations for us? Never, ever forget, He has great plans for you. The sixth present. Speak and seek the truth. In John 4 and 23 we read, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers, worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. The prophet Joseph Smith defined the gospel as all truth. John also stated in the 8th chapter, the 32nd verse, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Seneca wrote, Time discovers truth. What is truth? asked Pilate, and then it didn't seem he was interested in finding the answer. Whether you are a scientist or not, make pure truth an eternal objective. It is only when you are honest that you are safe. Seventh gift, seek to retain or to reobtain the heart of a child, particularly at Christmas time. Backward, turn backward, O oh time in your flight. Make me a child again just for tonight. In the Daily Mail, a British newspaper dated December 21st of last year, an article was printed reporting that Laura Goffin, six years old, had been told that she was naughty. During the stressful time many families go through while decorating for Christmas, in a hasty few words she was informed that Santa wouldn't be coming down the chimney because of something she had done to aggravate her parents. Now six-year-old Laura had a nagging fear. Would Santa overlook her little brother and sister too? She decided to plead the cases of her four-year-old sister Abigail and two-year-old brother Alfie in a personal letter to Father Christmas. She wrote, Dear Santa, don't come to me as I have been very naughty. 
And I told my mommy, I don't want any toys for Christmas, and I don't even want Christmas. But as a postscript, she added, please come to Abigail and Alfie, but not to me, Laura. Her note, dropped into Santa's letterbox outside the town hall in Melford Haven, touched the heart of the mayor's secretary when she read it as a Yule season assignment. It sparked a hurt, which caused her to search and finally find the little girl who was prepared to miss out on the festive fun of Christmas, but didn't want her little brother and sister ignored. A sweet little girl whom the world had not yet polluted. Well, the mayor gave her a new doll. Her parents were startled in the way she had responded, to which she said, well, I'm sorry I'm naughty. I promise, Father Christmas, I will be a good girl from now on. At Christmas time, one year, President George Albert Smith, a humble, childlike man, visited the bishop's storehouse. The prophet took off his relatively new overcoat and gave it to Deseret Industries for whoever might need it. Those who were there protested heartily the, that he had done so and wanted him to keep it, but he would not take it back. Finally, his sister took his coat and sewed in a little message, Whoso wears this coat will wear the coat of our prophet, George Albert Smith. Oh, to have the heart of a child. Eighth present, the gift of reality. Are you seeking the world of reality? Periodically, I will hear some less than thoughtful person criticize our lifestyle or demean that which we may be doing or believing in by saying, hey, get real, join the real world. May I communicate with each of you that the real world is that which our prophet, church leaders, and scriptures define. It is President Gordon B. Hinckley who is walking in the real world, and how blessed we are to have him. A number of years ago, as I was leaving the church office building a day or two before Christmas, I found myself walking next to Elder Bruce R. McConkie. We wished each other a Merry Christmas. I drove home and surmised that he had done the same. The day after Christmas, the telephone rang. It was Dave Worthlin, who at that time was administrator at the LDS Hospital. Guess what happened just before Christmas, he asked. I don't know, I replied. Well, Elder Bruce R. McConkie came to the hospital. He asked if he could give a few blessings, and with permission granted, he went from room to room to room, placing his hands on the heads of several dozen patients. Brothers and sisters, that's the real world, isn't it? Ninth present, be an effective giver. You know, there's a line that we all must step over. It marks the place where an individual goes from receiving more pleasure from giving than from receiving gifts. As a senior in high school, several of us have deci had decided to sub for Santa. We had been given the name of a single mother who had three little children. They lived in a rather dismal apartment house with dirty walls, steps, and hallways. The whole building needed a coat of paint and a scrubbing. The doors didn't even fit very well. We gathered food and toys and clothes, and excitedly, we ascended a rickety staircase to the door with the number on it we had been given. A tired woman invited us in. There were no warm Christmas lights or even a tree to greet us. Her little children seemed too frightened to speak. As we placed the gifts around a tree we had bought and did some decorating, we observed a large, quite new television set. Our gifts were soon distributed, signaling that it was time for us to leave. The little family said very little as we slipped out of that dark place and went home. Father greeted me as I arrived home. How did it go, he asked. Well, fine, Dad, except uh, I sputtered they had this large TV set, and, and that was a time when many people could not afford a big television set or even a small one. My father said something like, what does that have to do with it? I stammered, well, why didn't the lady buy Christmas toys and decorations and food for her family instead of the big TV, I answered. Maybe that is all they have for any happiness in their lives. Dad replied, 
I realized what he said was true. We had observed how little else they had. Suddenly, my whole immature attitude spun around. We had blessed four people, and that was all that mattered. We're never quite the same after an experience like that. Some of my own pettiness evaporated that night as I realized how much we had enjoyed giving those gifts. President Howard W. Hunter said, let us look backwards for just a moment to our childhood and analyze that which gave us the greatest happiness when we were children. He further said, I'm inclined to believe that the things we enjoyed most and those toys that we received gave us the most happiness when we were children. They were the things that were given to us. When our parents went away and returned, we always looked for a little token they would bring back to us. We looked forward to Christmas because of the things that we were going to receive. Our whole life was built around receiving. At that time, we did not understand the other side of giving. Sometimes during our progress through life, we come to that point when we suddenly realize that it isn't in the receiving that brings us much happiness. To some this comes early in life, to others it comes later, and I'm inclined to believe that there are some that perhaps never have this awakening during the whole length of our lives. They miss one of the great principles that bring happiness to us. End quote. Yes, hopefully we will all be able to completely leave those years of childhood when our thoughts are more self-focused than they should be. Victor Herbert captured the truth when he wrote, Toyland, Toyland, little girl in boyland, while we dwelled within it, we were ever happy then. Childhood joyland, mystic merry joyland, once we've passed its portals, you may never return again. Tenth present, bless others with your hands. Are they busy lifting the burdens of others? Are they used as a happy greeting as you shake another's hand? Uh, marriage vows are taken while holding hands. The diploma you will receive from this institution will be given to you with hand outstretched. Hands give blessings when placed on another's head. It is with our hands that we write a term paper, paint a painting, play the piano, or wave to a friend in parting. What about the hands of your professors as they write upon the chalkboard or help you utilize a test tube, a computer, or a scientific measuring device more effectively? Hands symbolize so much. Whom do your hands applaud? How do you use your hands? By wrapping a gift, by helping a friend? with a complex mathematical problem that needs to be delineated. Each of you is learning to become more self-sustaining and skilled in your life's pursuits, and yet each of us need a hand to lift us one time or another as we go into those bad chapters of our life, or at least a painful day or two. A couple falling in love as they hold each other's hands are saying, it's you I love. These same hands could be saying, I will protect you. I will strive to be a good servant of the Master. I will play with a child, help a colleague move, or signal a Merry Christmas as we speak those holiday words. President Gordon B. Hinckley reported a pioneer Christmas he had learned about. He quoted a story he had read in which the author wrote, I remember the Christmas of 1862. All of us children hung up our stockings. We jumped up early in the morning to see what Santa had brought, but there was not a thing in them. Mother wept bitterly. She went to her box and got out a small apple and cut it into little tiny pieces. That was our Christmas. But to this day, I have never forgotten how I loved her dear little hands as she was cutting that apple. Incidentally, this year, President Gordon B. Hinckley has been in 20 countries, has had 137 speaking assignments, with 731,600 in attendance. And this does not include general conference, nor the many other engagements he attends, as he represents the Savior and each of us so well. The 11th present, 
offer the gift of generosity. The level of our sharing with others is the level of our love for others. It must be combined with large doses of self-forgetting. Generosity, at least in part, symbolizes our maturity level. On the birthday of our children and grandchildren, my wife and I distribute a dollar for each year they have lived. I'm 63 years old. An eight-year-old granddaughter had been festering about the fact that I had just sent her eight dollars for her birthday, but that she couldn't afford to send me 63 one-dollar bills for my birthday. Finally, she hit upon a solution to her frustration. She said to our daughter, Mom, I know how I can do for Grandpa what he does for us. I will send him one dollar for every ten years he has lived, that's six dollars, and another three for the three and sixty-three. She sent me back her eight birthday dollars plus one extra, never caring she had lost a dollar in the transaction. Beginning a number of years ago, a young woman, Kathy Conwell, collected angels to put on a special Christmas tree she had at home. Kathy was a lovely young woman, a college student, who learned that she had a very violent, aggressive form of cancer. She had been told that she would not live long, but that medical science would do everything it could to assist her, and she also received several blessings, of course. Her collection eventually grew to 156 angels, covering a six-foot tree with lights and those angelic decorations. Kathy and her mother, Joy Conwell, would go to yard sales, post-Christmas sales, and anywhere where little angels could be located at her untimely death in October 1996. She asked her mother to distribute these angels to her friends. I was blessed to receive one of them. I have kept it in my office now for more than 400 days. She's now an angel herself, but her generosity goes on blessing so many of us. Twelfth and last present, understanding the supreme Christmas. The scriptures remind us that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. All the world should be taxed, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. The greatest person ever to live on this planet was born. What can I give him, poor as I am? Well, if I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I can, I give him. Give him my heart. Which brings us to you and the gifts that you can give Jesus. Yes, Christina Rossetti penned, I give him my heart. But what might that mean? Give him my heart. James, the Lord's half-brother, thoughtfully wrote, Every good gift and every perfect gift, the atonement, is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. This being true, then, we must help others to grasp the true meaning of the atonement and Christmas, which is Christ. Think of the influence you students can have on parents, siblings, friends, and relatives, helping them to think about Jesus even more this year than perhaps they have on earlier occasions. You will never forget this Christmas if you do. Next, a while ago I read of a survey of more than 6,000 teenagers, not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, pertaining to their feelings about the Scriptures. Only 14% said they considered reading the scriptures very important at all. Perhaps that would even be true of some of us. 
When the students were asked about the importance they placed on a variety of activities from their relationship with others and God and to helping others and reading the Bible, that placed lowest. And yet surely Christmas time is the best time of all to read the scriptures. Think how the circumstances surrounding the birth of the baby Jesus comes alive when we read Luke. This Luke who had learned so much from Mary because he wrote the things that only she could have told him. Then include with those beautiful verses those found in 3rd Nephi, the 12th chapter, and that area of the Book of Mormon. It will add tinsel to your Christmas tree this year, and that's a promise. It follows then that you have an opportunity to introduce a sacred spirit to all that goes on. Merchants of things have invaded the minds of most people, disregarding the holy day characteristics of the Christmas holiday. Commercialism has turned it into a day of feasting and foolishness and football instead of family and friends and faith and following Jesus. There are exceptions, thank goodness, that each of us know about. But now let us take you and transplant you wherever you will be on Christmas Day. You're popping up with gracious enthusiasm, kindly expressing your love for the Savior and those of your family and others with whom you will come in contact will make this Christmas the best ever. And isn't that the spirit of Christmas? Perhaps Johnny Hart, the great Christian cartoonist, said it as well as anyone. He wrote a Christmas poem that appeared in his comic strip uh, B.C. four years ago. It read, Follow the star and you shall see his gift of grace to you and me. Follow the star that followed the youth who gave us love and taught us truth. Follow the star that follows the man who takes us where none others can. To where our hopes and treasures are Follow, oh, follow the star. Yes, the supreme Christmas give is Jesus. The loving Father let him hang on the cross even after he had cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did Jesus need to suffer so this perfect person? Because the Father, brothers and sisters, loves us so most, so much that we have this greatest gift of gifts, becoming purified through his atonement. Also thanks to a loving Heavenly Father who provided his firstborn Son to give us examples of how to live and in what to believe. Resolve to give yourself to him as your supreme gift. And uh, if you do, next year, and all the years to follow will be lived in concert with what our Father and Jesus have hoped that you would become. To these simple truths I testify in the name of Jesus Christ, our Master. Amen.